This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. This is Stefan Tilkoff for Software Engineering Radio. My guest today is Vaughn Vernon, who is a consultant, mentor, and author best known for his contributions in the domain-driven design community. Vaughn has more than 25 years of experience in software design, development, and architecture. He's written a book on DDD called Implementing Domain-Driven Design and teaches a course based on that material all over the world. In this episode, we talk about the topic of his most recent book, Reactive Messaging Patterns with the Actor Model. So Vaughn, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Let's dive right in and talk a bit about reactive programming. What does reactive programming mean and is it something new or something that we've been doing for a long time? Well, it's it's both new and old and I'll, I'll explain why I say that. Uh, uh, reactive programming, let's say, on the server side is um being you know going through repopularization now or or becoming popular um on the client side however or in the ui you could say that uh reactive programming has been going on for a long time um but just to give you some history as far back as 1973 carl hewitt uh, was working on this experimental model called actor model. And although the computing power and so forth that was available at the time, um, wasn't really suited for, uh, parallel or concurrent processing, Carl Hewitt still, um, formulated this, this model to, uh, computation way back then in 1973. If we move forward to the mid to say late 1980s, early 1990s, a lot of people, a lot of developers started working with GUI uh, programming, whether it was on the Windows API or using X Windows or something like that. Um, uh, they were using reactive programming, even though it probably wasn't called reactive at the time. I mean, I, I don't remember that it was. It was just GUI programming, what I was doing at the time. And uh, so the, the idea, though, is that um, as a user would move the mouse or click some command button or type uh, some information, some characters into a field, the UI behind the scenes was reacting to this because there were constant events flowing as the user moved the mouse or clicked the mouse or clicked a button or typed. This caused various events to be um, uh, created and, and sent to the program and the program would react to those. So you could say that a lot of people have done reactive programming, especially if you think in terms of, uh, let's say, doing um, uh, web development today, if you've ever written any sort of JavaScript that reacts to uh, the UI that you're presenting to the user in a browser and you react to some sort of mouse movement or button click or something like that, then there is reactive uh, programming happening there. Mm-hmm. In terms of reactive on the server side, this is something that is being popularized now and, and something that's a bit different. And uh, so you can imagine using the same basic principles, same concepts, but where components on the server side are reacting to uh, some sort of stimulus rather than just the UI. Okay, so, so explain to us how the actual model actually works. Okay, so 
actor model um, focuses on an actor as the central uh, and, and primary unit of computation. Um, this means that an actor is like, you know, you might think of an actor as uh, this, this cell or a single responsibility kind of computational unit that's responsible for one thing and one thing specifically, and it knows how to handle or react to um, some set of incoming messages so it reacts to some sort of stimulus and uh, as a reaction to that stimulus it may change its internal state it may send a message back to the sender of the message that it is currently handling or it may send out messages to other actors um, as outgoing messages all at the same time the actor does not have to be concerned about the typical concurrency problems that are faced by various um, uh, um, other kinds of, you know, a different style of computing where we're using multi-threading across any number of components because um, the actor is receiving the message asynchronously and it's receiving the messages one at a time. So it never has to worry about two threads um, working through its state at the same time. There will only be one thread assigned to the actor at any given time. So this means that uh, the actor must also share nothing about its internal state it, uh, it must just um, uh, keep all of its internal state to itself. And thus, because of that, as it is handling one message at a time, that message handler can operate on across the entire state of the actor and not have to worry about race conditions in any way. Um, so that's, you know, primarily how the actor works. You could also think of the actor as being kind of a perfect transactional boundary that everything that happens within the actor as it's dealing with one message at a time is a, is a perfect boundary for uh, transactional control. Um, and no other actors outside uh, of that actor will be influenced directly by what happens to the state of the actor at that time. Um, so it's a it's a great transactional boundary as well. So it sounds a bit like like sort of an an act, active object of some kind. It has some properties of objects, but it also has a thread of control. Yes, exactly. That's itself. a good good way okay. to put it. Think of think of an actor as being an object, um, and you you might think of uh, an object that has methods on it, and public methods can be invoked by other uh, um, objects, well, it's, it's similar with actor, except that when you uh, send an actor a message, it doesn't immediately invoke a method on the actor. The message is received asynchronously from the message send itself. So the, the message will be handled, let's say, on a different thread um, inside the actor. Uh, so, so there is that asynchronous and concurrency um, going on with the actor, but inside the actor as it's dealing with that, it could call its own method internally. So yeah, it is sort of like objects uh, with asynchronous messaging. So um, how many actors would a typical system have? Would it be a lot or is it as many as threads? What's the approach there? Yeah. So um, it really depends on the application. Uh, if you were to look at a, a typical actor model um, toolkit or library, they're typically able to manage millions of actors if that's as many as the system needs. Um, it's really a, a matter of how much memory is available 
Um, and of course, how many threads can be run by the processor at any given time. But, um, uh, it, you know, depending on, on what your application actually needs, you could have um, dozens of actors or hundreds of actors or thousands or tens of thousands of actors, but you could even uh, scale as, as many as millions of actors at one time within a single node. Um, each of the actors is scheduled to run. It doesn't own a thread of its own. Uh, typically, the way that you would design an actor model library is uh, by having a pool of uh, threads that are available to be used by the actors and um, as and then there's a, a an internal scheduler that knows that um, that a given actor has uh, messages that need to be processed and so the scheduler will give the actors that have messages to process um, a thread for uh, some number of messages and uh, so the, the the computing is spread across the various actors through this scheduler mm -hmm. so what's the relation of the actor model to scala and akka okay so actor model again was um first uh worked on back in 1973 and if you were to look at the use of actor model from that time forward it was actually I would say you, you would have to admit that it was quite limited in use, primarily because there weren't a lot of cores on individual machines. It was more about scaling up than scaling out. If you, if you were to take a leap forward from Carl Hewitt's day until actor model was more widely in use, you'd have to go to look at the Erlang uh, programming language and uh, actors are supported in Erlang. Now, Erlang um, has become a more popular language of late, but I still would say that it's not really a uh, completely mainstream language like Java or C Sharp has become. But if you look at um, Scala, if you know enough about Erlang and then take a look at Scala and Akka, you can see a lot of similarities between the Scala programming language with Akka and Erlang. So, um, you know, if, if, if you kind of thought of uh, using it uh, maybe a little bit like an Erlang flavored language with actors on the JVM, that's um, kind of what Scala and Akka uh, give you. Although I would say that um, you can also get a real sense of, of Java's influence on, on Scala as well. So it's not just like programming in Erlang. So how would you, how would you compare um, the actual effects of those approaches? So I'm not talking about the theory, but the actual uh, programming experience when, you've, when you program using the actual model or program using a, uh, a thread-based model explicitly or maybe using i don't know um, um async io uh, in, an in an evented fashion what's the what's the what's the downsides and what is the what is the uh, what is the benefits of each model or particularly what is the benefit of the actor model right so um if you look at just object oriented programming you have an object you can invoke a method on an object um now in the in the small in the small talk uh programming language, um, believe it or not, uh, Smalltalk, you know, is a language that is based on message sending. So if you think about a method invocation on an object, that's, that's more of like a modern way for us to talk about it because that's actually how it works with Java or um, with C Sharp. But with the Smalltalk language, when I have an object, I literally send it a message. The method that gets invoked on that actual object is a mapping of a message send to um, a, 
a method selector that's internal to the object. And even though by default Smalltalk was a model that was not uh, concurrent, but um, you know basically each message sent to an object was handled on the same thread as the invocation or the the message send. Um, still, there was this idea of a separation between the external object that was sent a message and the internal object that received the message um, as a method invocation. So kind of if you think about it in that way, it helps us to take one step forward toward actor model or even concurrent programming. Now, if you just think about uh, that same small talk uh, application where I send a message to an object and that object is, uh, w when it receives that message send, then it's going to map to an internal uh, method. Think of that uh, point where the message gets sent as now happening asynchronously. So as soon as the message is sent, there's a queue somewhere that um, receives the invocation request, but the invocation won't actually occur until that object has an opportunity to accept the latest message and react to it. So that, that's sort of a, you know, a stepwise refinement to, to getting toward actor model. On the other hand, if you think about um, multi-threaded programming in general and the kinds of uh, programming APIs that are available to us, let's say just with the Java programming language, um, we have a, a concept of a thread. And basically it's our responsibility as programmers to create a thread, to start the thread running, to um, uh, somehow receiving input to that thread. How do we, how do we receive input? That's up to the discretion of the application designer or the or the tool designer that's um, uh, working on this this concurrency approach to programming. So there's there needs to be some way for that thread to receive some sort of input. But let's say that we're running our thread on a loop, and uh, whenever we don't have any work to do, we um, we decide to sleep, and whenever we do have some work to do, we allow that work to be done, and then we go back into a sleep and wait mode until we have, uh, you know, some more input to process. And because there is no way to, you know, automatically prevent that thread from receiving input from multiple threads at one time, we have to be worried about synchronization. So do we, do we have, um, you know, full rights to the data that that thread has within its object, its, its um, object state at any given time? Or uh, is it possible for that thread to receive multiple um, input requests simultaneously and therefore, we have to get into things like, um, you know, do we synchronize this method or do we synchronize this hot block of code within a method? Um, how do we synchronize it? How do we make sure that we don't turn our multi-threaded program back into a glorified single-threaded program because we are just so poor at writing multi-threaded code that that's what we end up doing is just blocking everything around some critical section of code all the time. Um, with actor model, we don't have those concerns because, um, again, the actor is the, the central logical unit of computation, and we have a scheduler that understands when the actor receives a message that it must at some point receive a thread or be given a thread to run on for some period of time. And the scheduler may allow the actor to run that single message that it's received. Or if there are five messages, 
that have been enqueued for that actor, it may allow it to run all five of those messages before it takes the threat away from that actor and decides to give it to another actor. So if you, if you look at the internals of um, how an actor model is, is created or designed, you would probably see a thread pool where um, the, the, the pool has a number of threads that can be optimally used by the application at any given time. Let's say that we have a processor that can handle uh, up to 16 threads. So we've got, or, or a node, a machine that has either a number of, of uh, processors or a multi-core processor. And let's just say that the configuration of this node is uh, such that it can handle 16 threads at a time. You might decide to have uh, all 16 of those threads given to the, this uh, uh, actor model pool of threads which would mean that at any given time, there can be up to 16 different actors running on the processor, but it's the task of the scheduler to schedule each of the actors in an efficient way that um, allows that, uh, that processing to take place across, like I said, either dozens or hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of actors over a period of time so that the, the um, actions are, are complete and um, the, you know, no, no actor is starved for processor. Okay, so what you're saying, I think, is that it is the actor runtime that takes care, in this case, Akka, that takes care of uh, mapping the application level concept of an actor to the operating system or runtime level concept of a thread. So as an application programmer, I don't have to do that myself. I can just focus on building actors, which will be mapped to the underlying uh, um, resources as efficiently as the runtime can make it. Exactly. And um, also to address, I think you, you were asking for sort of the the flavor of programming with actors, it is different. It is, you know, as soon as you start to deal with concurrency and you realize I've sent a message to an actor, but the response that I get back will not uh, cause me to block until I receive that response, but I could do something else during that time or I could um, give up the processor and allow uh, someone else to use it, which which means I literally do nothing. I just finish the uh, the receive handling of the message that I've currently received, and I return. And when I return, um, the processor automatically gets or or a a thread uh, on a core gets handed to another actor to use. Well that's a different way of thinking. And, and as soon as you realize that you're not doing synchronous programming anymore and that, uh, you ask an actor a question and you're not going to block until you get a response that kind of changes your mindset and you have to think a bit differently, but, um, it's, it's good to learn to think that way because it allows the actor model to, um, be as, you know, performant as, as it possibly can be on a given machine at any given time with the number of actors that have to process messages. So what I'm wondering is, am I not exchanging one way of doing things for another and just exchanging one level of complexity for another level of complexity? Isn't it the case that once I am within the actor world, uh, there's simply a new set of patterns that I have to learn, which are just as good or bad as the patterns that I'm used to when I program using the thread model? Or is there a, 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 you know, a difference in the quality? Is there a different, are those different kinds of patterns, not just different patterns, but really a different category of patterns that I'm working with? Well, there, there are a different um, set of categories. If you've ever used, or category of patterns, I should say, um, if you've ever used any sort of messaging uh, middleware, whether it's JMS or MSMQ or, or something like that, uh, RabbitMQ, whatever it happens to be, 
um, you, you know that there is a difference between synchronous and asynchronous programming. So if, what if you thought in terms of sitting down and writing an application and you would never invoke a method on another object? You would always send a message and that message would somehow map to another object and that object would handle that message asynchronously. Um, and you were going to do that with JMS or RabbitMQ or MSMQ, and um, you were going to design an application that way. Obviously, you're trading uh, one set of qualities for another, and there are some complexities to thinking um, in an asynchronous kind of way and in a messaging kind of way where everything is, is um, you know, detached from from the other object and you, and you don't have, um, the actual benefits, let's say that we, that we've become spoiled with, with blocking. But what I would add to that is while it is different and while it introduces a new set of challenges, it also has to introduce a new set of benefits. Otherwise we wouldn't use it. And where the benefits are found are, um, you know, let's say for the enterprise that we're used to working on software that um, is, you know, we, we get a, re a web request. The, the web request comes in, uh, it's assigned a thread at that point in time by, let's say, um, the, the, the thread is assigned by the web tier, and now we have a thread and now we can um, delegate internally to our various layers of software and we're and um, we're, we're going to delegate from a controller to the application layer and the application layer to the domain layer. And the domain layer uh, will cause some sort of persistence um, interactions and so forth. Well, what we have to recognize is that that thread that was assigned from the beginning is being used 100% by that single request that came in from the web. And while we're waiting for the database to do something, let's say, let's just pick on the database for a moment. Um, while we're waiting for the database to do something, that thread is blocking and it's waiting. And it might wait for seconds at a time. Well, we only have a finite number of threads. Let's use the same number I've been using. We have a node that has the ability to run 16 threads simultaneously. That means that that entire powerful machine that, that is running may be blocking 16 different times on the database and nothing else is happening on that machine for that period of time because it can't happen. The, we're waiting on the database and, we ha and we, we, we've assigned threads to requests. On the other hand, if we think about actor model where instead of blocking for a database to finish for us, we've sent a message to a database that says we want something and we know that in some period of time that database will send a message back to us. That means that we're not blocking waiting for the database, we're simply inactive and the thread that would have been assigned to us in a normal uh, N-tier web application is now in use by some other thread that can move forward. So literally, we could handle, um, you know, dozens or hundreds of more uh, application level requests, you know, from the web tier than we could in that same period of time with just the 16 threads that are end up going to end up being blocked at the database instead of being used by other actors at the same time. So that's where the real payoff uh, comes from. And Two, the, the, you know, the problem that we're um, facing with computing is processor speeds, clock speeds have fallen off for about 10 years now, I believe, if, if we were to look at the trends. And so pro processors are not getting any faster or not exponentially faster like we saw in, in previous decades. So as processors are, are flattening out in their ability to perform, what do we do? If we're, if we're still 
you know, only handling 16 requests at one time, the processor is just sitting there doing nothing while um, these, these 16 different web requests are being, uh, are blocking for some sort of database response. Whereas with actor model, we're moving other things forward with the same processor simultaneously. So that's where the, the payoff really comes about is, is using the processor to the fore, to, uh, to, to the full, I should say. So if you were to go to you know, some sort of monitoring, if you could monitor uh, all of the threads or all of the, all of the cores uh, that are running on a given processor, and you were to look at that um, N-tier web application, you would see, you know, potentially like a zero percent uh, if when when all of those processors were were waiting on um, database, you, you would see a zero percent usage of of your processors of your cores. But with actor model, you wouldn't see that. You would probably tend to see almost 100% utilization of the processor at all times, even when we are waiting for database uh, response to some request by some actor to the database. Okay. I, well, while, I, while I would argue that, of course, you'd, you would um, configure your system to use more than 16 threads. If you can run 16 of them, you'll maybe use 64 or 128 or whatever the number is. You're still absolutely right that m what, what most of them will be doing is probably wait for some I.O. operation to, to become, uh, become available. And so is it a fair assessment to say um, the actor model is a good in-between choice between the threaded model, which you just described on the one hand, and a model where you just use something like non-blocking I.O., asynchronous I.O. explicitly? It's, is it sort of the benefits of the thread model combined with the efficiency of the async non-blocking I.O. stuff? Right, right. So um, even, even with Akka, you may have, let's say, a database um, uh, driver that, that is synchronous, and so you will still... Um, have something blocking, but you can design your system such that you'll only have one actor doing all of your database um, interactions. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you're only blocking one thread at a time and all the other threads are, are running, you know, per the scheduler. The thing that I would say is I've done enough multi-threaded programming, you know, in, in real business, um, operations that I know that I would much prefer to have used actor model instead of those multi-threaded, you know, traditional multi-threaded approaches like in Java where I own a thread and I have to make this thread uh, spin and work just, just perfectly. Um, there, there are j just enough headaches and, and caveats um, with multi-threading, those typical multi-threading approaches, that if you're doing anything other than very trivial kinds of work, um, I think it's been proven that most multi-threaded program, uh, multi-threaded code is just absolutely wrong. And so at some point in time, even when you think you've got this multi-threaded solution working perfectly, it's going to reach up and bite you in ways that... Um, You've never, you know, you never planned on and didn't see coming until it happened in production. And, and that kind of problem will just tend not to happen with actor model because uh, the, the model itself is, you know, tuned around concurrency and you really don't have to think about and worry about the kind of concurrent problems that would normally happen you just really are are focused on what this single actor must do at any given time. Mm -hmm. So, why do you think we have this this growing interest in the in the various in the various approaches to reactive programming? Why is this now becoming more more and more uh, um, important for people? Well, I think if you look at the cool kids on the block, like uh, you know some some newer um, trends in, in computing, let's say like Twitter, let's say like Netflix or, um, 
you know, companies like this that need to uh, provide to find performance gains uh, in and and really push their hardware to the very limits at all times. Um, this is where you know companies are are really pushing the envelope, and I think that you know it's it's just simply a matter of they have to in order to produce the kind of solutions that they need to produce for for their uh, subscribers for their users. Um, the the other side of the coin is though the enterprise just a typical enterprise when you think about whether it's financial organizations or um, medical and healthcare organizations or, you know, just uh, what, whatever you might think of as being um, some sort of typical enterprise software. Most of these companies are still riding heavily on, you know, the typical uh, J2EE or JEE um, kind of, of uh, uh, server approach um, or .NET or something like that, maybe PHP. And because of this, um, enterprises are, are, you know, if they want to scale, they're either adding bigger boxes or they're, or they're trying to figure out ways to, you know, scale their web tier higher and higher. Um, but, you know, they're, they're going to continue to sort of reach the point where um, if they need to scale beyond what their, you know, their, their technical or their monetary means are, it's going to be very difficult for them to, to scale, you know, very easily. And I think that um, that's where actor model really needs to make penetration is into the enterprise where, um, you know, a typical software uh, development team working on a typical enterprise application is going to, to need to use actor model or reactive extensions uh, more to make, to just basically make better use of the limited number of computing resources that they have in the, in their uh, production data centers. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the approaches that I know you have taken is uh, you've uh, sort of, um, implemented or take taken a look at uh, a bunch of almost classic um, enterprise integration patterns. In fact, I checked and we had an episode on a book called Enterprise Integration Patterns with uh, Gregor Hoppe in, in episode 42 of this podcast almost seven years ago or eight years ago. So um, how, how did that experience go and how did you how did you arrive at this idea of doing that? Right, so um, what happened is I, uh, I was, I was working with, um, actor model, um, some years ago and in fact with Akka and, uh, I, I, you know, had conversations with some around the type safe that that's the, the company that, uh, has developed Akka and, um, some of their trainers and, and consultants and so forth. And, um, I was kind of surprised that Akka hadn't yet at the time, this is two and a half years ago, probably that Akka hadn't really made, uh, inroads into the, into a typical enterprise. I was, I saw it at, immediately as something that, um, you know, should accomplish that. So I started, th you know, just, filed that in the back of my mind. And, uh, as I was working with actor model, um, at one point I, I noticed some overlap in, uh, the patterns of the, the enterprise integration patterns with, uh, Gregor Hope and, and Bobby Wolf. And, uh, I, I was just curious to see what would be actually the mappings if, if we were to take, you know, all of those patterns how would they fit into actor model? How could they complement actor model? And um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that there's either a one-to-one -one or near one-to-one -one overlap of some patterns with actor model and also um, 
you know, where, where actor model doesn't directly implement some of those patterns that the other patterns can be used, uh, very extensively in application and integration kinds of development efforts. Maybe you can give us a brief overview of some of the patterns that are in that book. What is uh, for those listeners who have never heard of the book and have never read it, what kind of patterns are in there? Sure. If you looked at one of the earlier chapters of the Enterprise Integration Patterns book, you would see patterns like message channel, message, um, pipes and filters, um, uh, various kinds of messaging routers, message translators, <clears throat> and message endpoints. So that, that's an early chapter, and it kind of takes those at a high level, uh, introduces your, you know, the reader to the thought process of, of how might I use a message translator or how might I use a general message router. And then uh, the book fans out from there, and it's, it says, okay, now that you understand, for example, what a message router is, what kinds of message routers are available to you? Well, there are content-based routers. There are um, process managers. There are different flavors of message routers. So, um, for example, Akka does address some kinds of message routers naturally in its API, but it doesn't have a built-in process manager. It doesn't have built-in let's say, um, uh, splitter or uh, other kinds of content-based routers that you might expect. Um, it, and if you were to look at uh, messages in general, what are the kinds of messages that you want to use with actor model? So there's a generic message, but is it a command type message? Is it an event message where you're receiving a notification of something that has happened in the past? Or is it, um, for example, a document message that may be the result of a query where um, the, the message carries some notable uh, cross-section of information, but it doesn't demand that you use it in a certain way. So that's where the Hope and Wolf book um, kind of takes us. So, you know, message channel, message pipes and filters, message router, message translator, and message endpoints, different kinds of endpoints. So if you think of taking each of those sections and comparing it to Akka, uh, let's say message channel, well, we can compare uh, the actor model in general or ACA to the message channel pattern that could be viewed as the FIFO or first in first out queue associated with each actor, or in other words, the actor's mailbox where are messages received. Um, and although I think it's been stated outrightly that there isn't really a message channel associated with actor model, that is the closest association. So we can make a near comparison and, and get the benefits of conceptually comparing um, an actor, an actor's mailbox to a message channel. On the other hand, if we look at a pattern like uh, process manager under message router, well, that's a very powerful um, pattern that, that uh, we can use in you know very specific ways to design our application around uh, processes that like like uh, uh, long running processes, what some people call sagas. This is something that um, is very useful when you're using actor model, and Akka doesn't provide that out of the box, but it does provide the the building blocks that we need um, to create, uh, for example, a a uh, process manager. So one of the things that we maybe didn't didn't talk about yet is that Akka is a system that is able to run on multiple nodes, not just a single machine. At least that is my that is my uh, assumption. I hope that's a yes. correct one. 
That is correct. So, so uh, assuming it does, uh, I have a feeling it kind of blurs the the line between application architecture and integration architecture. And you used the term your application multiple times, even though the patterns that we talked about are from a book called Enterprise Integration Patterns. So, do you have this feeling that this that this line is is being blurred or? Can can uh, can ACA and can the patterns just be used for both? Yeah, I th it's a good point because um, uh, originally when I started on the the process of blogging about these patterns, I um, sort of started out more leaning toward the the integration. Uh, use of them, although actually the patterns that I was using was for the application, for example, process manager. So I think it is blurred and I think they can be used in both ways. I, th I think if you were to actually um, look at various designs uh, that Hope and Wolf used, it, it was lending itself to integration, but that's because they were writing about integration and they basically said your strongest you know method of integration is to use messaging and therefore because you're using messaging here are the patterns that you would use with messaging well when you look at actor model it's all about messaging and you're not you aren't just either integrating or working in your in your application model um, you're probably doing a bit of both. And process manager is a very, very strong um, pattern for, for use with application design. So let's say that we have a domain model and we're modeling each of the uh, concepts in our domain model as an actor, then maybe we need a process manager that knows how to coordinate the messages that are being sent between actors so that um, we don't couple those actors too tightly together and they can re, you know, remain a single responsibility uh, principle kind of component. And so you'll use a process manager to decouple those and, and track the process management of it and then just allow the actors themselves to be focused on what they do best um, as a single responsibility um, component. So I definitely see the lines blurred. I would also say that in using actor model, um, let's say that you are integrating with some sort of legacy system that doesn't support actor model. The other strength that you have here is that you can model the integration using actors but the actors themselves may just be um, a, a set of integration tools with the legacy system. So um, you're, you're able to model uh, the, the, the problem domain into a solution that, that actually you know, is close to the problem domain. And then behind the scenes, you can make the integration work however it needs to work. So you would have some message translators, you would have um, some channel adapters, some message bridging going on there. And, um, and so it allows you to keep your mind focused on the problem domain and not just so focused on the solution domain that you forget conceptually what are we trying to do here, but you can actually model according to the business concepts. Mm-hmm. So one of the nice things that I one of the things that I find nice or that I consider to be nice about the actor model is that it actually actually uses the uses a means that can be used for cross system communication and makes it the def the default as opposed to solutions that try to make the local communication model the one that can be used remotely if you know what I mean so that's a, that's I think a very useful property of the whole approach um, so. so uh, maybe let me let me get to that domain aspect. And you 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 mentioned in the in the introduction, and I mentioned in the introduction that you've actually uh, written um, a book on domain driven design. Can you very briefly define for our listeners what domain driven design is, and also 
uh, tell us if there's any connection to the to the stuff we've been talking about for the last for the last few minutes? Sure. So, um, domain-driven design fundamentally is about understanding what is core. And when I say what is core, what is strategically most important to the business uh, at this point in time. We have a very complex project ahead of us and we want to make sure that we don't um, lose track of what, what our focus should be on, the thing that's going to, let's say, give us some competitive advantage or some financial advantage to um, to you know with with our business so we're going to um, try to focus on what is core well domain driven design really forces us to answer the question what is core and and if we have identified our core Uh, concepts, those belong in what is called a bounded context. And a bounded context then continually forces us to say, is this concept core? If it is, it belongs in the context. If it's not core, it's out of context, which means we're going to have to either implement it someplace else or buy a piece of software that, that helps us to achieve what we need to have because it is a necessary um, thing to, to implement this in some way, but it's still not core. And so domain driven design is, is very heavily driven around, uh, keeping track of what is our, our main core, uh, strategic advantage for this specific project and what is not, and then designing software accordingly. And it gives us a set of those kinds of strategic design tools um, that help us to to deal with, you know, what is core, what is not, and how do we integrate with other systems, um, and then also a set of tactical tools for, um, typically, you know, how do we deal with um, entities in our system, how do we deal with uh, services in our system, and and so forth, and it helps us to to model those according to what we call a ubiquitous language. So within a bounded context is um, a language that is expressed in a software model, and this software model adheres to linguistically the kinds of conversations that we have with the business about how this software should work. So um, it, it, it's, it's a bit to take in, and my book addresses this um, and also my, my workshop, but you know, the, the thing is that th there's a bit of a learning curve to, to grasping, um, domain driven design, but you can also boil it down to some fairly, you know, understandable concepts that you can use, keep under your belt for, for, uh, project work. So given that we have a set of strategic patterns and a set of tactical patterns, how does uh, actor model fit in? How would we use uh, actor model like um, with Scala and Akka or Java and Akka or something like that? Well, I alluded to before, what if, what if you actually modeled your domain as a set of actors? One of the um, uh, tactical modeling tools that we have in domain-driven design is called aggregate. And the aggregate is basically a transactional boundary, but also a business boundary. And it, it tells us where we should put um, basically constraints around a cluster of objects. Could just be one object, actually. It could just be an entity. But it could be an entity with some other value objects or other entities. And where do we put a transactional boundary around that such that we can design our system so that only one aggregate is committed in a single transaction at any point in the business process. So that's kind of one of, that's one of the tools is aggregate. Well, what I find is that uh, an actor model, an actor actually 
makes a very good um, aggregate. So like I said before, uh, much earlier, an aggregate or a, an actor forms a natural kind of uh, transactional boundary. That means that it makes a perfect aggregate. So if we design our domain model around actors, we're automatically deciding where should our transactional boundaries be within this system, within this model, and how do I want, you know, what, what are the operations that I want that actor or aggregate, uh, synonymous now, to perform, and how do I persist those? Um, one uh, of the projects, very interesting project available with the ACA uh, product is the ACA Persistence Toolkit, which really focuses around what I've been talking about. Um, basically designing actors as aggregates and using a, uh, a pattern called event sourcing to output the representation of the state of one of your aggregate actors as a set of events that are time ordered. And if you read those events back in the same order in which they occurred originally, then we have uh, the ability to reconstruct the state of the actor aggregate from nothing into what its current state should be according to those events that have previously occurred. So, um, and as, as each message comes in, each command message comes in to an aggregate actor, what it produces as its state transition is one or more events and those events get saved in a journal, and that journal is then used to reconstitute the state of the actor when the actor may go away for some reason for a period of time when we need to bring that actor back into memory in, in the system, then uh, we basically reconstitute it from those saved events. Event sourcing is, is uh, that what that technique is called. So... Um, yeah, I think there's there's a big overlap. I think that with the Scala language and with uh, Akka, we have a great opportunity to cut out a lot of the boilerplate that exists in uh, the Java language and with um, you know some of the ceremony that goes on there with with programming and just get down to the ubiquitous language that's being modeled inside a bounded context and. The, just the message protocol of how you send a message to um, an actor in Akka uh, cuts out a lot of the visual overhead and allows you to just focus on the ubiquitous language. So I, I think there, there's a lot of really good overlap. I, I uh, actually reference my book and domain-driven design um, fairly thoroughly throughout uh, the Reactive Enterprise book. And uh, so I think readers will see a, a, a very good practical overlap there. Okay. So if, uh, if our listeners want to uh, find out more about this approach, about this model, what are some good places to start and to familiarize oneself with, with this new kind of architecture? Well, right now... Um, my book, Reactive Enterprise with Actor Model, is available on Safari Books Online. There's a, a Rough Cuts version out there. Um, the book will be in print and in an and in electronic form, uh, you know, in, in time. Maybe, maybe when our listeners are listening to this podcast, we don't know the schedule yet. So yeah, we don't, end up yeah, we don't know the schedule yet, but um, uh, you can certainly see an, an early... Uh, publication of that on Safari Books Online. Um, and in the first three chapters of the book, I focus on actor model, using actor model as ACA, and also performance, uh, and how you can see performance gains with actor model. So probably something like half of the book is just focused, generally speaking, on actor model. And then the latter part of the book is uh, an implementation of 60 plus patterns that um, 
were available in Hope and Wolf. So that's, you know, that's a good place to get an introduction to actor model. Uh, I would also say that um, the ACA documentation at ACA.io, you can, you can find at least, uh, you know, your way to where the documentation is housed there. Um, it's quite good documentation, actually, especially at a high level and um, does, you know, provide a fairly good introduction to it. Uh, there are some other publications out there. There are a few other ACA books. Um, there, there's a new book, which I think is very promising. It's by one of, it's by the lead of the, uh, technical lead of the ACA team, Roland Kuhn, and his uh, co-author is Jamie Allen. And uh, that's called Reactive Design Patterns, I believe. Um, that's available in early access mode from from uh, Manning. And Jamie Allen has another small book on Reactive. There are a number of books out there. If you If you just go to Amazon.com or Informit, dot com or or something like that and and look for um actor model or reactive you should find you know probably uh i'm going to say somewhere around four or five books at this point that are available so um yeah i think that that would be a good place to start okay so vaughn it's been a very interesting conversation thanks a lot for your time yeah it was good having you on the show Thank you very much, Stefan. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support.